Hi everyone, my name is Neil Murthy and I'm an MPH student in the Department of Global Health. It is my great pleasure today to introduce to you all Dr. Judy Ann Bigby. Dr. Bigby served as the Secretary of Health and Human Services at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts from 2007 from 2013. As the longest serving Secretary of Health and Human Services, she was responsible for implementing many of the aspects of the 2006 Massachusetts Health Care Reform Law. This law achieved a nation-leading health insurance coverage rate of 98% for adults and 99.8% for children. She also worked closely with Governor Deval Patrick to address the high cost of health care. Under her leadership, Massachusetts became one of the first states to integrate care for those who are eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. She has achieved significant improvements in mental health services, child welfare, public health, health care for the disabled, veterans, and the elderly in Massachusetts. In 2011, Dr. Bigby was appointed by President Obama as one of the inaugural members of the Advisory Group on Prevention, Health Promotion, and Integrative and Public Health of the National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council. She's also a member of the Board of Directors of the National Quality Forum. Prior to her appointment as Secretary, Dr. Bigby served as the Director of Community Health Programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Director of the Center of Excellence in Women's Health at Harvard Medical School. She attained national recognition for her pioneering work to eliminate health disparities among low-income and minority women. Dr. Bigby holds a BA from Wellesley College and an MD from Harvard Medical School, as well as honorary degrees from Lesley University, Pine Manor College, and the New England College of Law. Currently, she is a Menschel Senior Leadership Fellow in the Division of Policy Translation and Leadership Development at the Harvard School of Public Health. Before I turn the program over to Dr. Epstein, please join me in welcoming Dr. Judy Ann Bigby. Thank you, Neil, and welcome, everyone. This should be an enlightening and enormously fun session um, to learn about leadership, its components, and the strategies that are most effective. We have with us today someone who embodies that. Judy Ann Bigby was just completed the tour of duty, as Neil said, six years as the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and before that, a 25-year history as an influential leader in academic medicine and community health. She's in her role as Secretary. She overs oversaw the enterprise that tries to improve health for all of our citizenry, and in particular, prepare us for the enormous changes under the Affordable Care Act and for implementing innovative programs like that for care of those with Medicaid and Medicare coverage. I should tell you that for quite a number of years, I served with Dr. Bigby, Judy, as a primary care physician at the Brigham Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. And so she's been a colleague for literally more than 20 years. And I should say, someone I admire tremendously. Thanks for joining us today, Judy. Thank you. Thank you for doing this, oh, Renee. Great to have you. I, I thought I might start with some questions that I find um, I'd like to get a feel for. One of the really important components of leadership is decision making. How do you make decisions wisely and how do you implement them effectively? I know that in your six years you had to do that again and again every day. Could you tell us a little bit about one or two, one would be fine, really hard decisions you had to make where the choices were not easy, the kinds of information you pulled together to make that decision, and the strategies you used to make sure that once you made that decision, you'd implement it effectively. Sure. You know, I could um, cite dozens of examples. Um, I think, though, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how we decided to approach payment reform in the Medicaid program. Um, everyone knows that payment reform is quite a hot topic. Um, Fee-for-service payments are deemed to be uh, one of the reasons why healthcare costs are so high and why, quite frankly, we don't deliver the highest quality care in the United States. Um, a lot of the discussion is about, is about, well, if we develop these accountable care organizations, 
many of which are centralized in hospital systems, we can pay them differently and that might lead to change. Um, if you look at the Medicaid program, we really serve two different types of populations. We have young adults and children who are relatively healthy, even though they are members of some of the most vulnerable populations in the state. They are relatively healthy and they don't need a lot of hospital care. Um, and then we have people like the duals who really represent a group of people who have a broad range of needs that stem from uh, their needs to be supported to live in the community, the fact that they have chronic disease, the fact that um, they haven't had access perhaps to care that they should have. So our approach was really not to focus on giving payments to hospital systems and then letting it um, come down to those populations, but to really focus on the on-the-ground providers who would be accountable for the care for those individuals. And I think people were surprised about that decision because we have so many wonderful large hospital systems in Massachusetts that have for a very long time been trying to become integrated systems. Um, so I, I think it's, it took some doing to convince the governor and others that this approach was more consistent with serving the populations that we really need to um, take care of in the Medicaid program and uh, recognizes the need that there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach, but an approach that allows providers to understand who the populations are they're seeing in their practices and designing care and trying to achieve outcomes that are specific to those populations. What you decided makes a lot of sense. Can you t tell us a little about how it got implemented or how it's being implemented? And well, it's not implemented yet. One of the hard things about making the decision not to stay another two years is that not everything is finished, uh, but that's not surprising. Um, we actually did a lot of work. Uh, one of the things that people said they appreciated about me as secretary is that I was a data-driven person. I like evidence to try to drive our policy. That's not always the case in government. Um, so we looked at the information to really get a better sense of where people were getting their care, what was missing, um, and what they should be getting, um, where the gaps were, and who should the providers be who are doing that. After looking at that type of information, we met with hundreds of people, with groups of people, with advocates, primary care physicians, um, hospital leaders, um, other payers in the state to make sure that we weren't developing a totally inconsistent policy. Um, part of the reason we got to this approach is we had actually convened a primary care patient-centered medical home council that was representative of providers across the state, all of the payers in the state, to look at the concepts around this type of approach. And it was with the blessing of that council that we decided to do this. So what I'm hearing is the general approach was internally to think about the evidence, to think about the problems, to fashion a first order solution, and then to take it out across the state to numerous stakeholders and get their valuable input. That's correct. Um, and then the idea was to do the financial modeling and actually look at um, how we could support that. I would say that one of the things that was really um, instrumental in helping us get to this decision is the fact that the Affordable Care Act mandates that primary care providers should receive increased payments in the Medicaid program starting this past January for at least two years, and states have to do that. And there are also increased payments for primary care providers through the Medicare program. So we also took the opportunity to build off of those um, uh, issues in the ACA to build our own approach to doing this. I'm sort of curious, I want to explore the part about policy implementation, because I think in some ways that is where the rubber meets the road in leadership. Can you get it done? Um, and clearly you had to do a lot of organizational change as part of preparing for the ACA and thinking through what it was going to mean. A lot of different 
people get impacted when you do that? What were the ways you thought about it when you thought about moving that change internally in your own department? and when you thought about moving it externally? So I think that one of the things um, that people do realize is that in many ways the ACA builds on the success of the Massachusetts reform. So some of those changes had already been in process because of the 2006 law. What um, I think worked for me and, and for this Patrick's administration is the fact that if you look at both the 2006 law and the ACA, there are many, many units in government who are impacted by the law. And uh, one of the things that I was responsible for was bringing together all of those governmental agencies that had some responsibility for implementing the ACA and tying it to the governor's priorities in terms of health care. Uh, and his priorities were to maintain the access that we had gained through the reform, to bring down cost, and improve the quality of care. So by having a common set of priorities to guide our implementation of ACA, by having everybody come into the same room and actually laying out who's responsible for which part of this bill, and how are we going to make sure that we work together, that we inform each other about the policy decisions that need to be made um, so that the governor was hearing from one voice and as secretary he asked me to lead that. So having a process where everybody comes together and quite frankly learns from each other and makes sure that everybody's rowing in the same direction was a really important part of how we went about implementing ACA in Massachusetts. And I can tell you, uh, the first meeting that I had of all the governmental people who were responsible, there were 40 or 50 people in the room. So it wasn't a small thing to try to coordinate that massive amount of policy implementation. And how many of them were in your department? Um, less than half. So the Attorney General's office was there, the Division of Insurance, uh, the Department of Revenue has a role in this. Um, so it, it was quite a, a diverse group of governmental leaders, if you will. So you've already started to touch on this. this the state has been involved in this massive health reform now for some period of time, very successful. Um, might you just restate again what was your role in it and what surprised you most about participating? Well, as you know, the law was passed in April of 2006. Governor Patrick won election uh, in November of 2006. And so when I arrived on January 4th, 2007, many of the components of the Massachusetts bill were kind of sitting there waiting to be implemented. The connector had already um, established itself. It was amazing that between April and October of 2006, that whole agency was up and running and they began to um, switch people out of uncompensated care to a real health insurance product. Um, one of the things that um, was very interesting about that process though is the huge role that Medicaid played. Because if you look at those individuals who were eligible for those state subsidies, they're people who go back and forth in terms of their income. One month they could be eligible for Medicaid and the next month be eligible for the state subsidized product. Um, one of the things that we worked really hard on is trying to make it so that as people's income changed because they were in um, dynamic positions that they didn't lose coverage. That was a real challenge and we learned a lot about that process that we brought to our implementation of the Affordable Care Act to try to decrease the churning, as it's well known, uh, in, that, in that space. I think th the other thing um, that was surprising about um, the implementation of the health care law is that the $3 million that the legislature put on the table to do outreach to inform people that they were now eligible for health care coverage worked really well. 
And people were very concerned in the first months of our administration that people were coming out of the woodwork, that the costs were going to be much higher than um, estimated because what happened was people didn't gradually become insured. They kind of all became insured all at once. Um, and what's amazing is that that 160,000 people who ended up at state subsidies and then another 30,000 or so who ended up in Medicaid um, reached the height pretty quickly. Um, and so I think that that's a, a great lesson learned. But one of the things that I had to learn in state government is don't panic. Don't do something without getting all the evidence first, um, because there were many people who were talking about, oh, we've got to turn this off. This is not going to work. There are too many people. We can't afford this. Um, but we held on to the fact that this is the purpose of the bill, and this is the way it was supposed to be implemented. And I think through the recession, the very fact that the uninsurance rate in Massachusetts dropped by very little um, showed that the bill works well. It predicted what would happen when people lose employment and become uninsured. And um, so we didn't lose a lot of ground on people being insured. And, and I think that that's an important lesson. And again, with federal help, we were able to maintain those people in coverage. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to turn it over, over to the audience in a moment, but I, I want to just follow up one more link you've given us, which is you describe yourself quite aptly as an evidence-based decision maker. And I think that's, that's I, I personally like that style a lot. When you reflect on your own style of decision making and leadership and implementation, are there any other characteristics that you would talk about that come to mind as much in the same way of evidence-based for making decisions and so forth? Well, I think that, um, you know, um, I certainly learned that the right thing to do wasn't always the best policy or uh, wasn't always accepted as the best policy. Uh, having goals and priorities and things that you want to achieve <laughs> so that you can always tie your decisions to those priorities is a really important part of um, what I had to do during those six years. As you know, we had a great recession. Um, I had to do a lot of budget cuts. I think that over the time um, that the recession started and kind of began to fall off, I probably trimmed the EOHHS budget by something like $5 billion over those years. Um, having principles by which to make those decisions, um, and as I said, trying to hold on to the priorities that we set, this is what we want to achieve in Health and Human Services. These are the outcomes that we would like to see for the populations we're serving. Um, it didn't mean that we never uh, touched the budget as it related to those principles, but um, it was an important um, foundation for my team, for the agencies, for everyone to understand how we made the decisions that we made even when they weren't popular, um, at least we could demonstrate, here is why we're not cutting X, but we're cutting Z instead. So having a plan, having priorities, having outcomes that everybody understands uh, and that are achievable was a really important part of that process. So let me underscore some of the lessons. It's um, having goals, having priorities, having a plan to achieve them, and then using evidence to figure out which is the best way to go. That's, there's, that's quite a, a guide for us to have. Let me open it up to some questions here or comments that folks want to make. And as you do so, please introduce yourself by name and your affiliation and um, sally forth. Please. Hi, Suzanne Brundage. I'm a master's student here at the School of Public Health. Um, as we were reminded of this week, emergency preparedness is a very important part of any leader's job. And I'm wondering, as you reflect on your tenure, what were the difficult decisions you had to make in preparing the state for um, a major catastrophe, as we've seen? Thank you. So, you know, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, 
I can tell you that the nature of my job required um, many more responses to disasters or emergency in the state than I ever thought was going to happen. I mean, most people think about 9-11, um, and certainly the bombing on Monday is equivalent to that type of thing. But, you know, we had tornadoes for the first time in 60 years in Massachusetts that swept through much of western and central Massachusetts and totally uh, wiped out whole communities and towns and made people homeless. We had an October snowstorm um, that also created lots of problems for people in terms of housing and access to essential services. We had a tropical storm that um, was, you know, going to come here as a hurricane, but ended up just being a tropical storm, but had a huge impact. Um, the ability of our agencies to um, actually implement the emergency plans that we had was something that um, kept me awake at night when I first started as secretary, because I felt like that was the the thing I had the least experience in making sure we could implement. So just the fact that we all sat and reviewed the plans and went through them. Um, we had a emergency management uh, specialist in the Department of Public Health who I made available to all the agencies to make sure that uh, everyone knew what they were supposed to do. And um, working with other secretariats was a really important thing. Um, all of the uh, other secretaries, for the most part, housing, transportation. We held many emergency phone calls with hospitals in the uh, Massachusetts area around whether or not we were going to close the T down or not under certain of these things. The H1N1 flu epidemic. Um, hit at a time that, uh, quite frankly, nobody understood what it was or what it would mean. And we became the state, uh, the first state, who could accept samples from other states to test for H1N1 after CDC um, was impressed by the way that we did that. So I think that acknowledging that you don't know everything and making sure that you get somebody who does know how to do this type of thing um, and bringing all the team members on so that everybody knows their roles and responsibilities uh, was the approach that I took to emergency planning. Hi, so my name is Zach Neider um, and I'm also in the Health Policy Management Department. Um, um, and my question is a bit about um, the use of evidence in leadership and policy making. Um, and it at least appears that when, in the state of Massachusetts, when there's debate over the correct path to take, that there's obviously lots of disagreement, but that the disagreement is kind of done using evidence and it's uh, a fairly rational debate. Both sides are, are looking at the evidence and coming up with what they think is the best path. And we see on kind of the national stage that's not always the case, that uh, not all sides are using evidence uh, I would say in an honest fashion. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, leadership techniques when you feel that the evidence is clearly on your side that it's pointing in a certain direction and the opposition simply uh, is, is unwilling to kind of uh, agree. Yeah. And believe me, <laughs> I could think of many examples where I felt like maybe they just don't hear what I'm saying. You know, evidence is. Uh, uh, a very flexible thing in some ways and quite frankly for a lot of the things we do there isn't sufficient evidence to put a stake in the ground and say it has to be this way. But there is also a balance between um, using evidence and accepting an approach to doing something that represents maybe what I'll call a good enough approach. Um, one of the reasons I think the 2006 Massachusetts Health Law finally p passed and has been successful is because a coalition of leaders representing business, 
healthcare providers, the payers, government, and advocates got together and said, well, I can look in here and see something that I agree with and that I think is the right thing to do. Maybe I don't agree with everything, but I can accept it. So it's not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, sometimes when there is a policy that you feel is very um, or could be detrimental and is, could be harmful, obviously you have to stand up for that and you have to fight for it as hard as you can. But um, compromise is a really important part of leadership and knowing when to do it um, and how to do it is also very important. You know, the people you have to work with are not going to go away just because they got their issue or they didn't get it. Um, you have to work with them over and over again in, a, um, in government and when you're trying to implement policy. So knowing when to stand down is an important um, part of leadership. Hi, my name is Shelley Liu. Um, I had a question about your transition from academic medicine um, into policymaking, and I was wondering if, you know, um, this framework of thinking about health, um, if there was like a shift when you shifted into policymaking um, or how smooth the transition was? So, if you look at my um, pre government or pre political career, um, I was never a traditionalist in the, in the way that I did things. When I was doing my residency in internal medicine, I was, I'll never forget this, I was seeing a Vietnam vet in my clinic who had had um, a bacterial endocarditis because he was an IV drug user. And he almost died on my service at the VA. He didn't have anywhere to go because he wasn't um, a, a service connected vet, so they'd only saw people for emergencies. But anyway, I was trying to manage his high blood pressure in my clinic. He had no insurance. There was no way he could take, he could get meds, he couldn't afford them. Um, and there really wasn't really great drug treatment in Seattle where I was doing. So I, I, I was sitting there and thinking, you know, I could be the best doctor in the world, but this man is still going to die um, because of barriers to accessing care and the larger context of his life. And that was when I decided I should go back to Harvard to do a fellowship uh, in the Brigham Harvard system at the time. So my whole approach as I stayed in academia was trying to look at the broader concept uh, context of the social determinants of health. I, and um, there were many ways that I tried to influence policy. Um, Governor Dukakis appointed me to uh, the Public Health Council, which is the advisory body that uh, informed public health policy. That entity still exists. All of the people on the council are gubernatorial appointments, so I had the opportunity to experience in that way. Mayor Menino asked me to serve on the Boston Public Health Commission when it was created after uh, Boston Medical Center became a private hospital and I did that for 10 years. And a lot of the things that, um, the reason the mayor asked me to do that is because he was so fascinated by our conversations that had nothing to do with his health when I was seeing him, um, but had all to do with, Mayor, you know, you should look at these things if you want to improve the health of Bostonians. And so there are opportunities to think about this even when you're in clinical medicine or academia, and I just took advantage of doing that. So the transition, um, the political nature of it was definitely uh, something new, but the, the whole idea of thinking more broadly about health and not just medical care, about thinking how we can improve uh, policies to promote health um, was not new to the way that I had been thinking about it. My name is Cheryl Barber. I'm a doctoral student in social and behavioral sciences here at the School of Public Health. Um, so kind of going along with what you just said in terms of this idea of uh, improving health and not just focusing on medical care, what are some of the things that um, 
you were able to do um, as secretary to kind of address social determinants, whether it was at the community level um, or through policy that wasn't necessarily health policy? Um, and what were some of the, um, I guess, challenges in doing so um, when some, sometimes we focus so much on like access to care? So there were a few examples I could give you. Um, one of the reforms that Governor Patrick um, pushed for uh, and his team was really successful in getting was redesigning the way transportation is governed in Massachusetts and pulling together multiple transportation entities and making one department. As part of that initiative, um, we worked with the Secretary of Transportation to develop what is called the Healthy um, Transportation Compact. And it is a signed agreement between the Secretary of Health and Human Services and Transportation to do things like um, if, if as transportation is being designed to look at ways that it might influence health and to try to make sure the design promotes health as much as possible. Um, we work together to convene a group to look at access to transportation for people with disabilities and came up with some recommendations about across the entire state how to fix that. Um, I worked with the Secretary of Education to develop an approach to um, making it possible for children in what are called the level four or underperforming schools in Massachusetts to go to school ready to learn. Um, education is focused on the quality of the teachers, the curriculum, the length of the school day, the length of the school year, those types of things. But I actually knew from my work, um, working with the schools in Boston when I was at the Brigham, that the parents have lots of issues, the kids have lots of health problems, asthma being number one, but behavioral health issues being um, very prominent um, and that they don't go to school every day. So w I worked with the Secretary of Education to develop a three-pronged approach to addressing in those underperforming schools how we were going to make sure the kids attended school, how their parents were going to access needed services, and how we were going to make sure that those kids were getting the medical and behavioral health needs that they needed to have addressed. So those are some examples of the way that we looked more broadly. Julian? Oh, they need a mic to record me for posterity. Excellent. Okay. I'm Jillian Steele Fisher. I'm in the Department of Health Policy and Management. Um, and um, you spoke uh, a minute ago, um, I thought a really interesting perspective. You said, you know, the transition to sort of your role as secretary wasn't so large because you'd been thinking broadly about these issues. You'd had these experiences um, that allowed you to get a vision of, of what was to come in some ways. And yet you said, you know, the politics was a little bit different when you got there. And I'm hoping you might speak to us a little bit about what you mean, what were the politics when you actually entered that field? Where did you feel that really pressing in on you, particularly perhaps with respect to this idea of um, focusing on evidence base or, um, you know, the, the scientists and all of us are, are curious about that. And I think, what could you have done when you were thinking broadly to think about the politics explicitly as well? Maybe advice for, for others here. So I'll answer the last part of that question first. I think that the influence that external people have on policy is very important. But there is a strategy. There is a way to do it to become effective. Um, and you know, I'm on a zillion email list that says, please send a note to your congressman to pass the, or your senator to vote yes on the amendments for the gun bill that didn't do well yesterday. But I, and yeah, maybe some offices count how many emails they get. Um, but it's really the people who are willing to um, grab the people who have the influence and sit with them and really hammer away at why their position is so important and to also help them understand how they can do it. Not simply it is good policy to raise taxes on 
uh, you know, these exempted tobacco products, for example. Um, but here's how it can be done without your suffering, you know, being called the tax and spend Democrat. I think that for, so for external people, understanding the process, um, I remember that one of the first times I went to the State House when I was working with a group of women in Boston on breast and cancer uh, disparities, they organized a meeting with legislators in June to try to get money in the budget for the program. Well, that was, you know, way too late. You need to do that in January, not June. The budget is already decided in June. So simply knowing those types of things is um, important. But the influence that people externally can have is very important. Internally, it's complicated, which uh, I didn't mean to say, because uh, everything is complicated. But you know, I worked for Governor Patrick, and I represented him. And so everything I did was um, with the lens of, I work for this administration, I am doing what I'm doing on behalf of the governor and his priorities, and um, I'm not the one who is important here, it's the governor. So balancing that, uh, when you're trying to promote the right thing, it isn't that you know there was disagreement or whatever but I wasn't speaking for myself and sometimes it was really hard when you're passionate about something uh, to remember that so balancing that was one of the difficulties politically um, so hearing none for the moment from the audience before we stimulate through I have some myself I was thinking about what leadership is today and reflecting on the partisan nature that, he, that one of the questioners alluded to and the constrained resources, it seems to me that a lot of what goes on is trying to make decisions in a world in which we can't have everything. And generally new program development and every politician who sets a goal and priority wants to do some of that, appropriately so, really means curtailing some other programs or frankly just cutting them. Um, what was your strategy? You, you, you alluded to before taking five billion dollars out of the budget. What happens when you had to give people bad news, and how did you go about it? And well, so the, I'll ask. I'll speak to the first part of your question first. Um, I would say that within three weeks of my becoming secretary, I was informed that um, I had to do a five percent budget cut to my budget. Now the budget at that time was $13 billion and a lot of the agency heads came in and they said to me, oh this is terrible, this is devastating, where are we going to find this money? And I said, well $13 billion sounds like a lot of money to me, why don't we really look at this? And as I said before, one of the things that I asked is, well what are we spending money on, what outcomes are we achieving and, you know, is this program really past its prime and is it really achieving what we want it to and is that a way to make sure that we can kind of redirect money to the things we have as priorities. Even when you do that and people acknowledge that maybe a program is no longer meaningful or successful, um, the money supports employees there are people behind the scenes who think it's helping them. And so having a conversation about, well, what is the impact of this going to be on the private provider who is getting that money or whatever, was something that we spend a lot of time doing. We call them impact statements. So understanding how many people were going to lose their jobs, how many people would have to get services elsewhere, what other ways would it impact other parts of the health and human service budget? So if you cut something over here, it just increases the cost somewhere else. Being able to have those types of conversations and do those analyses um, were very important before we you know, called people up and said, we're cutting the budget by X or we're eliminating this program or whatever. Having a strategy to, to really demonstrate to people that you knew how it was going to impact 
them and what the alternatives were um, was an important part of the process. So letting them know you'd done your homework and it exhausted all the efforts to ameliorate the situation. Yes, um, and sometimes finding creative ways to spend less money and either achieve better outcomes or the same outcomes, which sometimes, you know, I, uh, I gave a speech to the uh, Boston Chamber of Commerce one morning at the height of the recession, and I entitled it, um, A Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Waste. So using the opportunity to really sit back and say, where are we not getting value for the dollar that we're spending, and how do we demonstrate that to people? And offer an alternative, as I said, that might actually achieve better outcomes. Sometimes it was possible to do that. You're alluding to um, speaking for the governor. Makes me um, reflect. There you are, leading a major health organization, certainly the biggest in the state, multi-billion dollars, exerting tremendous leadership that has an impact across our citizens all across the Commonwealth, and yet you have a boss. Um, so it reminds me that those of us who are leaders still have bosses. C can you, without being indiscreet, can you say a little bit of how you <laughs> were able to manage that relationship, how that affected your boundaries, what the discussions were like behind closed doors when you were on an issue where you might have had a little bit of distance between exactly where the governor was? So I'm not going to answer that part of your question. <laughs> That's good. That was a test. He's being mailed this tape right afterwards. But, uh, you know, when Governor Patrick or Governor-elect Patrick approached me about being Health and Human Services Secretary, um, I was of two minds. One was, are you kidding? And the other was, wow, this is so exciting. Um, I did not know. Um, Deval Patrick that intimately before he was elected and before I went to work for him. I volunteered for his campaign because I believed in his message. Um, and after meeting him and meeting with him, I thought he was an ethical leader. So that was the thing that was most important to me. Um, and the fact that I believe he is and has always demonstrated that he is an ethical leader uh, was very important to me. I knew that I could not work for somebody who had different ideologies or different beliefs. It isn't that we agreed on every single policy point by point, but ultimately um, I signed on because I wanted to work for that governor because, as I said, I found him to be an ethical and moral person. and. The other stuff about, well, how do you manage the actual decisions um, all tie back to that um, belief and that philosophy and that moral ground. So in a way, it was very easy for me to have a boss um, who I respect and, and feel that he has done the best for Massachusetts that he could possibly do in a, you know, difficult situations. Um, his ability to kind of say, uh, well, yes, I see I don't have everybody lined up behind me right now, but this is the right thing to do and we're just going to keep trying, um, was inspirational. So uh, that was important to me. I would have been long gone if I didn't feel that. To your credit, you weren't, <laughs> and we're all happy for it. Let me, let me ask you another issue, picking up on the comment you made earlier about knowing when to fold them, so to speak. Um, I'm thinking of someone who's, the analogy here will be imperfect, but I hope it will serve us well, it was Senator Kennedy, who had among the many things he was noted for, one is that he was a sturdy defender of liberal politics on the left, and the other, at the same time, with that in context, he was also enormously effective about reaching out to others who had different views and finding enough common ground so that they could successfully move forward on policy. Now, his medium, of course, was the legislature and the formal vote, but, but you as secretary had to do that every day, maybe not with a formal legislature, but getting together with stakeholders who could try and thwart you or could try and support you together in a common enterprise. What did you learn during your 
time as secretary, anything that you can share with us about knowing how to go about that difficult process? Well, you know, I, I appreciate your bringing up the late Senator Kennedy. He was in many ways a mentor for me. I knew him for many, many years. He was one of the first people to congratulate me when I became secretary and I, I didn't, I wasn't shy about calling him up when I could to say, I'm not really sure what to do about this. How do we get some motion here at CMS or in the federal side of things to support our initiatives? And he was always willing to help. So one thing about Senator Kennedy that people may not know is that as famous and as much stature as he had, he was a people person. And he, it was not about him, it was about serving the people. So I think in the end, um, yes, he had some disappointments, but um, because he was in service to the people, I think he just kept going and tried to figure out ways to do things. Um, there were certainly um, times when Mostly, I would say, outside of the elected officials uh, in Massachusetts, out of that realm, but with um, partners in the private sector who might not agree or saw things different ways, where this notion about reaching across or um, coming to some agreement about, well, where do we agree, um, was really important in order to get something done. So. Um, you know, for me, the lessons that I learned from Senator Kennedy was that, you know, it was all about serving people and service that really, I feel, drove both his booming voice on the Senate floor when he had to kind of say to his colleagues, what are you not caring about these people? Or, you know, his more quiet moments of reaching across and working it out with folks. Turn here. I, I do have more questions I can ask, but let me see if there's others that have popped up. Well, in an audience of students, I don't want to leave unstated an important question that they might, might have, which is during your tenure, you certainly got to build your teams and hire a great number of people um, and got them into, move them into positions of responsibility, certainly in interesting occupations. What would you tell a student here? about the kinds of characteristics and training that, um, that, that might prepare them for a role to get into government in an interesting job someday? So um, that's a great question. And I think for students who are here who may eventually look at this, the one thing I want to say to you is that there is a role for people who are not expert in everything, who have not run the biggest programs or uh, gotten the most amount of money from research grants or whatever. Um, I considered the Executive Office of Health and Human Services a laboratory for learning and for exchanging ideas. Um, and from the lowest level people that we hired to come in to basically do some of the data analysis or more grunt work, um, they always participated in our meetings when we um, were looking at the options. Um, and I hope I made it an environment where they could speak up. So number one is um, I really valued people who were willing to thoughtfully talk about what their position was when they were given the opportunity. You don't always give your position in the room with your boss in it, uh, only if you're asked. Um, but people um, needed to be able to express an opinion and articulate something. I think that the other things that I looked at, looked for, especially in our more senior managers, um, was the notion that they would be part of a team. Um, the everyone that I talked to about the executive office when I got there said, well, you know, there are 17 agencies. They all operate in silos. They never talk to each other. They're serving the same people. Those people have, you know, 10 different case managers because they're in 10 different programs. 
And um, isn't there a better way to do this? And when I went and I looked at the structure, I said, well, indeed, there is a better way. And uh, from the first day I got there, I said, you know, we're all one team. Uh, there will be no finger pointing about uh, who missed the ball and getting something done. Um, and we have to work with each other and make it possible for everyone to be successful. So I articulated that to people as they came in and we interviewed them. And I said, if you can do that, then you can be on the team. The other thing I said, you have to be loyal. Uh, either you agree or to promote the priorities and the goals that we have. If you can't do that, this is not the right place for you to be. You can't be a square peg in a round hole. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that people couldn't disagree on particulars, but the broad vision, um, people had to embrace that. And if they couldn't, um, they needed to know that they probably weren't going to feel very comfortable there. A broad set of abilities, loyalty, commitment to group goals, important teamwork things. We're getting near the end now, Judy. Would you have any final words about leadership that you'd like to transport to the audience? or even maybe something that you didn't realize before you were secretary that you feel like you learned about this while being there? Um, you know, the one thing I want to say is that um, you've asked me a lot about hard decisions and successes and transformation, but you know, uh, leaders have to be willing to fail at something. Um, taking risks mean that you don't always know what exactly the right thing is to do. Um, and things don't always turn out the way you thought they would. Um, but the ability to take risks and recognize as you're going down a path, wow, this is not turning out the way I hoped, uh, and to change course and step back, or to simply say, well, this was a failure, let's move on. I think is really important. And if you don't allow your team to take risks, um, they're not going to push you as hard as you need to be pushed either. Because if everybody's just looking for their comfort zone, um, there won't be enough innovation. There won't be enough change. There won't be enough transformation. So not being afraid to fail has to be part of being a leader. Otherwise, uh, we could just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And, say, well, at least I'm no worse than X. So taking risk and acknowledging that sometimes things don't work out, I think, is a really important part of leadership. It's obvious to me that since you stopped being secretary, you've had time to reflect. And today's, today's discourse is part of the benefit that we get from that. These are a wonderful set of lessons for all of us. You've done an amazing job convening people in organized activities to pursue important goals in line with your priorities. And I've learned those today, and thank you for them. Appreciate your time.